Welcome to Lesson 1 of the first part of Ideas to Implementation. In this section of Ideas to Implementation, we will examine the discovery of cathode rays and the subsequent debate that raged from the mid-1850s to the late 1800s about their nature. On one side were German physicists who argued that the rays must be some kind of light or disturbance in the ether, and on the other side were English and French physicists who argued the rays were a type of charged particle. In this lesson, we will focus on the initial discovery of cathode rays and the experiments performed by German scientists that convinced them the rays were a type of light. In the next video, we will look at the experiments performed by English and French physicists and the resolution of the debate by J.J. Thompson when he discovered the electron. In the 1830s, work on electrical discharges in gases was performed by Michael Faraday, among others. Faraday observed that as the gas pressure in a glass tube with electrodes was reduced, the pattern of electrical discharge changed from streamers flowing between the electrodes to a steady glow, with a dark space, now known as the Faraday dark space, separating the cathode from the rest of the discharge. For two decades there was little progress until the development in the mid-1850s of a better vacuum pump and improved techniques for embedding electrodes in glass tubes by Heinrich Geisler, a German inventor and glass blower, which enabled lower vacuum tubes to be obtained. Around the same time, the induction coil, also known as a Rumkoff coil after its inventor Heinrich Rumkoff, was developed which could step up voltages from a few volts DC to thousands of volts. As you know from the previous topic, Transformers can step up AC voltages, but the input to an induction coil is DC. The trick used to produce AC is to use a magnet on a flexible metal strip as an interrupter switch. In its rest position, it allows current to flow to the primary coil. However, as the current increases, the magnet is attracted to the iron core, and this switches off the current, which then dies down until the magnet moves back to its rest position, switching the current on again and repeating the cycle. In the particular induction coil shown, this process happens about 30 times a second. The voltage produced in the secondary coil is about 15 kilovolts, which is sufficient to produce arcing across about 5 centimetres of air. In the early 1860s, John Peter Gassio used Geisler's improved tubes and Rumkoff's induction coil to study striation patterns that appeared at the lower gas pressures available with Geisler's mercury vacuum pump. William Crookes extended these investigations using a new improved vacuum pump, the Sprengel pump, which was capable of even lower gas pressures. As the vacuum improved, the pattern of striations changed and a new dark space between the cathode glow and the negative glow appeared. This is now known as Crookes' dark space. Julius Plücker is generally credited with discovering cathode rays in 1859 at the University of Bonn in Germany. He found that at the lowest gas pressures the glow completely disappeared and was replaced by fluorescence of the glass at the end of the tube furthest from the cathode. These rays became known as cathode rays as they originated at the cathode. He also made the important discovery that the rays are deflected by magnetic fields. In 1869, Johann Hittorf, who was originally a student at Plücke, demonstrated that cathode rays cast sharply defined shadows if an object is placed in their path. At this time, this rectilinear propagation was interpreted by the German scientists working on the problem as evidence that cathode rays must be some kind of electromagnetic wave in the ether. Heinrich Hertz, who we shall meet in more detail in the next part of Ideas to Implementation, was another German physicist who believed that cathode rays were some type of disturbance in the ether. He performed experiments which looked for the deflection of cathode rays passing between charged electrical plates, but he saw no deflection, and he interpreted his result as further evidence that the rays were not composed of charged particles. It would later be demonstrated by Thomson that the vacuum used in Hertz's experiment was not high enough to prevent the residual gas in the tube from ionising and screening the electrical field of the charged plates. 
Later, Hertz investigated the penetration of cathode rays through thin metal foils, finding that cathode rays could penetrate some types of metals. He argued that if cathode rays were particles, they would be too big to pass through the metal foils in the experiment. Philip Leonard continued Hertz's research after Hertz fell ill in 1891. He produced evacuated cathode ray tubes with a foil window at one end and demonstrated that the cathode rays penetrated the foil and could travel some distance through a further evacuated chamber. Leonard was certain that this meant that the rays must be an electromagnetic phenomena. In summary, by the late 1800s, German physicists including Pluker, Hittorf, Hertz and Leonard believed that cathode rays were a type of light on the basis that the rays produced fluorescence, followed a straight trajectory and so cast a sharp shadow, could pass through thin foil windows and were not, apparently, deflected by electric fields. The one incongruous piece of evidence was their deflection in magnetic fields, as this only occurs for charged particles, not light. In the final part of the lesson, we will revise the electromagnetic relationships between the force experienced by charged particles in electric and magnetic fields, so that we can understand the relevance of these observations in the debate about the nature of cathode rays. The force a charge Q experiences in an electric field of strength E is given by the product of its charge and the field strength. For positive particles, the force is in the same direction as that of the electric field, whereas for negative particles, it is in the opposite direction to the electric field. If the electric field is produced by two parallel plates, then the electric field strength is constant between the plates and equal to the voltage applied to the plates divided by the separation D. The fact that the electric field strength is constant means that charges, here a negative charge, entering the field experience constant acceleration, so their motion is parabolic and can be analysed using the equations of projectile motion. The force a charge experiences in a magnetic field is the product of its charge Q, the magnetic field strength B, its velocity V, and the sign of the angle between the magnetic field and the velocity of the charge. This means that charges at rest or moving parallel to magnetic field lines experience no magnetic force. A force is only experienced if the charge has some component of its motion perpendicular to the magnetic field. The direction of the force the charge experiences is at right angles to the magnetic field and the velocity, in a direction given by the right hand rule. Where your fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field, your thumb in the direction the charges are moving, and your palm points in the direction of the force on positive charges. Note that negative charges experience a force in the direction opposite to that of positive charges. Finally, a question to finish the video. If the cathode rays are travelling from left to right in the photo shown, would you expect that the rays had a positive or negative charge? 